सभी को नमस्ते अमा भगवान शरणम कार्यक्रम प्रारंभ होने जा रहा है Amma Bhagwan Sharanam. We have with us an ardent devotee of Sri Amma Bhagwan, the celebrated Dr. P. Sarat Chandra, senior professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. With 25 years of experience and over 20,000 surgeries to his credit, as team leader and in charge of the Center of Excellence for Epilepsy and Brain Mapping, he has over 300 scientific papers. His area of research is neural mapping and brain connections in relation to human behavior and functions. His research projects and lectures in over 200 international conferences makes him a former scientist of India who has served on several national and international bodies. He is a member of the Commission for Surgical Therapy for Developing Nations and fellow UCLA Los Angeles. Besides being the editor, Neurology India, an executive member, Indian Epilepsy Society, and Secretary, Cerebrovascular Society. He has been the former Secretary and President, Skull Base Society of India, and former President, Asian Epilepsy Surgery Society. His prolific academic career includes a number of publications, awards, grants, lectures, and patents. Arch Dr. Sarat Chandra Ji, we COVID-19 protection guidelines ke baare mein educate karenge. to chaliye. Abhi hum ye session mein milke participate kare or Dr. Hello, Namaste Dasaji. Namaste Sharaji. Can I join? No. Need one minute, Sharaji. Okay, okay, Dasaji. Namaste Sharaji, you can start. So namaste everybody. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And today I will be speaking about uh, the mechanisms of neurobiology of peace. And I like to put on my slides so that everybody can see my slides. So are you able to see my slides, Dasaji? Okay. So namaste, thank you very much for this opportunity. Today, you know, I would be speaking, I thought, uh, we thought that since we had such a wonderful week of world peace, perhaps as a scientist, as a neurosurgeon and a neuroscientist, I could somehow perhaps correlate between the mechanisms of the peace which we are striving to establish to that of what is present actually in terms of neural connections, in terms of connections in the brain, and is there any kind of correlations? And before I start my lecture, of course, I would like to uh, give my immense sense of gratitude to Sri Amma Bhagawan Vannes University, who formed the basis of this knowledge. And I'm just correlating with existing scientific knowledge and also immense gratitude to my parents because of whom I am what I am today. And of course, I have drawn uh, knowledge from various uh, scientific publications, some established scientific parameters, and also my own area of research publications for the past 20 or 30 years. 
Now, there are a couple of disclaimers which I would like to uh, share before starting my lecture. Now, obviously, this lecture has been compiled with some broad established scientific facts. And I have put aside, I put into it some of my own hypotheses and extrapolations. Uh, and that is that forms the basis of this lecture in which I try to explain that can there be a neurobiological of peace and why is it that we are not able to strike peace and what are what is peace in terms of brain connections and neural connections and now i would also like to state that this lecture is purely a personal opinion and not affiliated to any institution or any group now before I actually go into mechanisms of peace or rather the disruption of peace which we are experiencing during this time, I would briefly like to tell you about a wonderful organ which each one of us carry on top of our heads, in fact inside our heads, which is the brain. And the brain is composed of 8 billion neurons or the brain cells. So just like we have cells in the rest of the body, there are functional cells within the brain and these are called as neurons and uh, uh, Faji, can i uh, can i request all of you to mute i think there is some echo coming may i request all of you to mute your uh, audio i'm experiencing some echo So, yes, so I'm sure you can. Uh, can you hear me now, Rasaji? Am I audible? Yes, Sharadji. Yes, thank you. So, uh, now each one of us is endowed with a wonderful organ inside our head, which is the brain. And we have about 8 billion neurons, which is 8 times the size of the population of India. And these neurons, they generate electricity and that's how they're connected to each other. And uh, so much of electricity is now each neuron, each neuron actually generates, which is electricity in terms of some micro micro volts, but combined electricity flowing through the entire brain is enough to light up a 25 watts bulb. And these neurons are connected to each other, just like the CPU of a computer, except that it's million times more sophisticated. Now, just to give an idea how much of neurons we have and what is the degree of connections or connectivity between the neurons. Now, on the surface of the brain, we have something called as the gray matter, which consists of the brain cells or the neurons. And, the, and just underneath, we have the white matter, which consists of the wires or the cables connecting these neurons. So just to have an idea, under each one centimeter square of area, we have one million neurons. And each neuron has 10,000 connections. And the neurons talk to each other at the rate of 200 times a second. So you can imagine how talkative are each of these neurons. And what is the immense amount of activity which is going on in our brain in order to produce our own personality, our own thoughts, and whatever we are, whatever we do. So everything, whatever we do, in terms of moving our hand, or having our own self, or having our personality, having our emotions, having our thoughts, all this is because of the functions or the activity of these neurons or brain cells inside our brain. Now, how do the brain circuits work? We, we are just scratching the surface. We have hardly any idea, but yes, over the past three, four, five decades, we have got a huge amount of uh, information because the technology to understand the, the brain circuits has also improved in terms of imaging technology. We have wonderful imaging technologies like MRIs, like positron emission tomography, brain mapping imaging technologies. We can in fact insert electrodes into the brain and uh, record the electrical activity. And we have so many other techno. In fact, we can also, while after doing surgery in one of my labs, one of my scientists, once I do surgery and remove a portion of the brain in person suffering from epilepsy, he is able to put this brain tissue under microscope and insert electrodes into individual brain cells and record electricity from that. So despite our uh, technology improving so much, 
And despite the fact that we have started to understand how the neurons are connected, but I think there is still a lot of thing to be understood. But some of our best understanding comes from studying the brain networks in persons suffering from epilepsy, which is a disease, which is called as Mergi in Hindi. And that is where our most of our knowledge comes from. And this is one of my key passions of work or key areas of work where I've operated more than 1000 patients of persons suffering from epilepsy. And we have a, a huge area of understanding in this area. And our understanding of brain circuits comes mostly from looking at how is the connectivity patterns in persons suffering from epilepsy. Now, the portion of the brain which is involved in epilepsy mostly or in persons suffering from epilepsy is an organ called as hippocampus. Now, hippocampus is part of the old brain and I will tell you what is old brain and what is new brain in a few minutes from now. But this is what the hippocampus is. So this is the area of the brain which has been cut and deep inside is this organ which is called as hippocampus and it's so called because the shape looks like this seahorse which is also called as hippocampus. Now this organ is highly prone to develop epilepsy. It has immense complex circuitry and it's mostly involved in generating recent memory. By recent memory we mean that what has the person, what have we had for breakfast in the morning? Where have we kept our car keys? So these are all the uh, uh, these are all the areas which are involved in recent memories. And this is one of the highly studied areas of the brain. So if you go on to Google or you go on to PubMed and you type the word hippocampus uh, and you type the word epilepsy, you will come across at least 10,000 scientific articles which are published. So use now studying hippocampus. Now the connectivity patterns in hippocampus campus are many you know the connections are very very complex in fact studying these connections scientists have been able to develop the supercomputers by studying the brain connections but broadly what comes out and what is very well established are two behavioral patterns in terms of connectivity of the brain cells or neurons within the hippocampus and these two behavioral patterns or connectivity they include one is kindling so what happens in kindling? I know I'm kind of going into the scientific area, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. And you will understand later why this is important for us to understand the neurological basis of peace. So one behavior pattern is called as kindling. So I'll try to explain you what exactly is kindling. So now, as I've told you, each neuron is connected to 10,000 neurons and we have over 1 million neuron under an area of one centimeter square. And we have over 8 billion neurons. So in kindling, let us say there is a stimulation of one neuron. One neuron becomes active. Now it is connected to another neuron. And after some time, both the neurons, they become active because both of them are wired together like a CPU of a computer. And now what happens is after some time, when neuron A stops becoming active, neuron B continues remaining active. So there is a perpetuity or there is a continuation of the stimulus, the original stimulus, even when the original neuron has stopped becoming active. And these kinds of circuits are important you know, for uh, creation of memory patterns, emotions and etc. But the fact for you to understand is that because neurons are everything, how we behave, how you think, how we have emotions, how we interact with people around us, how we interact with the, the environment around us. So you understand, you have to understand that when the neurons, they become autonomous and they start firing despite the original stimulus not happening means that if you have some kind of emotion being generated after some time. So for instance, let us say there is a child. I'm just giving an example. It's a very broad example. So there is a child and now he interacts with a teacher. And the teacher is always to discipline. Let us say the teacher is uh, hitting the child with a ruler in the class or it's trying to discipline him. Later on, even when the child just sees the teacher, he is going to have those kind of emotions because these emotions have now become autonomous by the virtue of mechanism of kindling. So this is a broad example, but however, the emotional networking is much more complex. The second mechanisms, how neurons behave within our brain is called as recruitment. So let us say we have a neuron A, it stimulates the neuron B. Now both the neurons are active, both A and B are active. 
now b stimulates neuron back again now after some time the intensity and the uh, mag uh, frequency of stimulation of neuron a increases because there is a back stimulation of neuron b to neuron a and now neuron a will continue stimulating b and it will then stimulate a third neuron called as neuron c which means fundamentally i think what we can the caveat which we can draw from this is that once we once we provide a seed of a thought or a emotion and provided it strong enough it will not remain static it will continue to grow that is a kind of hypothesis which we can have from this kind of neuronal behavior because as you can see once a certain amount of stimulation is generated by mechanisms of recruitment uh, the stimulation will continue to grow within the brain so thus it's well known by these two mechanisms that once we have a stimulation of certain area of the brain it will not remain static or it will not remain same and it will continue expanding inside the brain so there is nothing like remaining static so if you put an uh, adequate amount of stimulation inside the brain it will have to expand or it will kind of slow down and die completely and based on the fact of kindling once you stimulate the neurons after sometimes the stimulation becomes automatic so even if there is no stimulations the neuron will continue stimulating by mechanisms of kindling now this is a slight extrapolation or a slight hypothesis which i'm applying here even though there isn't an actual scientific translation for that but it's well established that neural stimulation forms basis of thoughts emotions and feelings so it's good enough for us to assume that once we plant a thought or a emotion or a feeling now unlike thought and feelings it's been well shown by brain mapping techniques like positron emission tomography and other uh, advanced imaging technology that emotions they 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 create stimulation of large areas of brain we still don't have methods to map out thoughts uh, but when person has emotion uh, then we are able to see on brain mapping imaging that the large areas of brain are stimulated hence emotions are highly complex activity of the brain so if we generate an emotion there is good enough reasons for us to believe that it will continue expanding and after some time it's going to become autonomous or it is going to continue on its own so i am hope i am very clear here so dasari am i clear with this since i cannot interact with the audience i will have to ask you whether i am clear with what i am speaking yes sharad ji okay thank you so i will keep on asking in between to you whether i am making myself clear and you can give me a feedback whether i need to make it much more simpler because i want to explain this in the most in the in the in the simplest form possible now there is another behavior of neurons so we have spoken about the neuronal connectivity in which we have spoken about kindling and also about recruitment now we will speak about another behavior pattern of neurons and this is very important for us to understand you know, on how we behave and why we behave like that so whenever there is a stimulation which happens in the brain it is not that if you give little stimulation there is little amount of brain activity and when you increase the stimulation uh, there is little more activity uh, stimulation of the brain activity it's not like that the brain stimulation is all or none phenomena which means it is not linear so if you see here if you see here in the second graph when the stimulation takes place there is practically no activity but after a certain critical time the entire brain will fire with full force so the mechanism of stimulation in the brain is an all or none phenomena now with this three behavioral pattern let us now functionally try to understand what are the different types of brains inside us uh, can you excuse me for a minute first yes so now with this uh, uh, understanding this three behavioral patterns let us now understand what are the functional aspects of brains inside us so now if we look at our brain in terms of evolution in terms of functionality we actually have three different types of brains 
inside our inside us so we don't have one brain we have at least three different types of brains we could be having many more brains or many more functional units inside us so for instance when we speak about india you know it is not one country there are many states you know, and there are many cultures there are many religions so similarly inside the brain there could be many 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 functional units but broadly in terms of evolution we have three brains inside us and what are these three brains now the deepest area now this, this is how our brain looks like so these brains will have multiple folds on the surface so these are called as gyri and these are called as sulci and this is how the brain looks like it's very pulpy it's about 4.5 kg and it floats inside a liquid inside our skull now the deepest area of this brain the deepest area of this brain is called as the limbic lobe or the reptilian brain or the old brain and it's the most primitive area of the brain and if we cut open the brain this is how the limbic lobe or the reptilian brain looks like so it's a c shaped uh, structure which is situated deep inside our brain and i tried to look up what is the translation for the reptilian brain and this is what comes out it is it may be called as serpent shield mustisk mustisk which is the uh, reptilian brain So, Dasa ji, can you see my slide now? Yes, sir. Ji, we can see your slide. Yes, yes. So, please give me an interaction back because I think sometimes the internet is unstable. So, in case you are not able to see my slides properly, do give me a feedback, and I will wait or I will try to correct it. So, okay. like I was saying, that we have three brains inside us. So, the deepest brain is called as the reptilian brain, or the limbic lobe, or the old brain. and this is how the reptilian brain looks like it's a c shaped structure deep inside the structure of the brain now in between the reptilian brain and the outermost surface is something called as the middle brain and this is a brain which the primates or the monkeys have or other uh, developed other animals have and this is called as primate brain because it's not as well developed as human brain and on the outside what you see on the surface is the latest version of the brain which is called as neo cerebrum or the human brain or we can call as new brain and i have given this word called as the reptilian brain can be called as a creature survival brain and the human brain may be called as a species survival brain this is purely my nomenclature this is what i have put it and the hindi translation could be manushik mastisk now i'll tell you why i have given this uh, words now let us go to the reptilian brain the reptilian brain is the most primitive brain it's called as a reptilian brain because it's it's most active especially in reptiles not that they have only this brain they also have parts of other brain but this is what is most active within reptiles like snakes or amphibians and they have an interesting form of brain circuits so they have a circuit called as reverberating circuits so what are these reverberating circuits so this is like the process of recruitment where one neuron stimulate one neuron or brain cell stimulates another brain cell and this connects with another brain cell this connects with another brain cell and then there is a back connection of these brain cells again so as a result of it which once there is a stimulation which is implanted within these neurons these new the stimulation will continue to grow because they are reverberating circuits so these are most well made out in the reptilian brain which means that if you put any kind of stimulation within the reptilian brain 
this stimulation will continue to grow it will not stay static the more stimulation you put more it will grow you you cannot hope to bring down the stimulation by putting more stimulation it will continue growing and this has an impact to what i am going to say in the next few minutes so i hope you can understand this how the reptilian brain functions now what is the function of the reptilian brain the reptilian brain fundamentally is required for survival so that is why it allows the creature to either run away from that area from the danger or to attack or to fight so it's required for flight that means either you run away or fight which means you kind of attack the creature or it is required for reproduction that's it these are the only three fundamental functions of the reptilian brain there is no fourth function of the reptilian brain which is the oldest brain which is there in the deepest area of our brain and now there is an interesting organ which is called as amygdala it's a latin word and this is one organ i would have perhaps operated on patients over 1000 patients on this organ it's size of my little finger and now this amygdala has a very very interesting function it converts experiences into memories now i'll tell you what exactly i will tell you what exactly i mean for instance let us say we have a deer and it sees a lion so let us say there were about 10 deer and these 10 deer let us assume have never seen a lion in their life and now the lion attacks one deer and kills him and now rest of the deer understand that there is a danger and they run away now definitely the their limbic or reptilian brain has gone into action because it's a threat to their life now over a period of time even when they hear the lion growl so it may not be a lion growling but if they hear a growl which is similar to lion they will run away similarly if there is a movement which they think is because of the lion they will run away even if they see a yellow color they may run away even if they smell something which is similar to lion they will run away so even when they come across stimulations which may or may not be related to lion but similar to that their reptilian brain will become activated and they will run away because the reptilian brain has converted this experience into memories and that's how the reptilian brain works it converts the experiences into memories so am i clear here rahul ji is that your name i need a bit of interaction while i'm speaking yeah yes sir ji we can hear you oh wonderful thank you very much now what is funny is that somehow our advertising companies have understood this relationship and they have attached this kind of experience with your memory so for instance you know we see the advertisements like open a coke open happiness so they are subconsciously asking us to correlate coke with happiness and you look at this advertisement of coke in 1950s you know there are two children sitting very happily near a fireplace and mother is serving so many bottles of coca cola and you look at this happy family sitting here and now all of us the present generation kids you know they love going for birthday parties to mcdonald so there there are beautiful colors there they get a doll they get a cake everybody is there are candles there are all this beautiful things uh, what happens is subconsciously they are registering that this product gives you happiness and the sad part is even when the person becomes 50 years he has diabetes is become bald is having heart problems is having mental problems is having brain problems still he will feel like eating mcdonald and he feels happy while eating mcdonald because his reptilian brain has converted that experience into a happy memory it's not a correct compile it's not a correct correlation but that's how it has worked that's how the that's the mechanism how the reptilian brain works you have a happy experience it tags everything with that happy experience you have a traumatic experience it tags everything with that traumatic experience which may or may not be correct so fundamentally our reptilian brain which is called as an old brain technically it's also called as an archi cerebrum has only three functions which is flight fight and reproduction and it is required for creature survival it's not concerned about 
uh, collaboration. It's not concerned about the survival of the entire species. It is not concerned about ecosystem survival. It is not concerned about anything else. It is only concerned about its own survival. That's why I called it that it's concerned with the creature survival. Now, in, uh, in contrast to that, as and when newer brains have evolved, you know, more higher qualities, or I would say qualities related to the survival of the species have evolved. So these include caring, love, uh, you know, herd living, loyalty, nurturing children, need for affection, so on. Uh, so all this are the creations as and when the newer brains evolved. It's not that reptiles don't experience love, but predominantly they are always uh, functioning through their uh, limbic system. So that's why they're concerned about survival. So anything looks like a threat to them. So anything looks like they need to fight with anything or they need to reproduce. But as and when more brain is evolving more and more and more and more newer versions of the brains are developing, these are the qualities which develop. And human brain obviously is the most evolved brain and it is capable of all these qualities and many more many thousands of more which we have not even learned to understand so it's capable of love caring nurturing compassion empathy logic reasoning insight judgment intuition gratitude so these are all the capabilities which happen on the superficial layers of the cortex or superficial layers of the brain and that's why we call it as a new brain or a brain which is concerned with species survival so we have the capability of understanding that if the entire species has to survive we have to reduce the pollution. We have to stop cutting the trees. We have that insight. We may not be implementing it, but we do have that understanding. So if you look at it, like look at it, we have three types of brains, the human brain, the primate brain, and the reptilian brain. And logically and technically, this is how the control should be. The control should start from the human brain and the reptilian brain should be controlled. But what is happening? What is happening is completely the reverse. For some reasons, for which there is absolutely no reason, I cannot explain this. But I believe that we are all now being controlled by the reptilian brain. And now the reptilian brain is fundamentally capable of generating only three types of responses. It can run away from the situation or it can initiate a fight or it is involved in reproduction. But when these inputs come to a more complex form of brain, which is a human brain, these emotions are now developing to more complex type of emotions, which include various type of emotions for which we have given various types of labels called as hate, aggression, comparison, jealousy, anger, fear. But all of them are fundamentally arising from these three responses of the reptilian brain. And why is this happening? Uh, it's, it's not too difficult for us to understand why this is happening. Uh, because we are providing an input to the brain by which the brain now believes that there is war going on outside. So we look at the kids, look at televisions with a lot of violence. We have violence against women. We have these huge posters showing only violence. We open the newspapers. From top to bottom, we only hear about communal riots, we hear about uh, rapes, we hear uh, this person has died, that person has died. And then we also hear verbal abuses. So where are all these st stimulations going into? All these inputs are directly going to the reptilian brain. Because these come within the purview of the reptilian brain. This is an area of expertise of the reptilian brain. I'm a neurosurgeon. So if somebody has a brain tumor, they have to be referred to me. They will not be referred to an obstetric and gynecologist or an orthopedician. Similarly, so when we get this kind of inputs, where will the inputs go? They will go directly to the reptilian brain because the brain now thinks we are, there is a constant state of war outside or a crisis going on outside. So we have a reptilian brain, which is required for creature survivor, which induces a sense of competition because that particular creature has to survive. And this is what is getting overactivated. In contrast to the newer brain which we have, which is capable of ensuring the entire 
survival of the entire ecosystem which is in uh, capable of inducing a collaborative behavior uh, but what is happening is ideally the new brain should be stimulated but because we are stimulating the reptilian brain we can go logically into an auto destruct mechanism because the reptilian brain is not capable of species survival it will only ensure that particular creature survives it doesn't have the intelligence to understand that if that particular creature survives and everything else dies it too will die it doesn't have that intelligence it is only concerned with its own survival and unfortunately that is what we are over stimulating if we stimulate our human brain we can definitely evolve into higher system but that is not happening i'll give you an example let us say we have this person who is a very evil person and he has a traumatized let us say this person so this he has been let us say abusing this person or verbally abusing this person or hitting this person or hurting this person and because of which now the entire brain neurons go into a state of stimulation every time this person comes into view so this person is definitely a threat for survival of this person and now this is got registered into this person and every time this person now sees this person he thinks that this person is a threat now after some time he is going to meet another person which will look very similar to this person but is not a threat at all he could be just similarly dressed he may be speaking in a similar manner he may be behaving in a similar manner but he is not a threat at all but still the brain will perceive as if this person is a threat and now if this goes on the neural connections against this person will go on expanding because now the brain thinks that there is a threat for its survival and after some time by the mechanism of kindling these emotions will become autonomous so even when you meet people who are not a threat to you the only kind of emotions you will start expressing are the emotions which you have expressed when you met the person who has been a threat for you i hope i have made it clear rahul ji am i clear with this yes sir ji yes because this is very very important to understand you meet a person who is a threat for you he has induced a certain kind of emotional patterns under you stage 2 you go and meet a person who is similar to this person in appearance or in color or in behavior and again you perceive that this is a threat for you and after this the emotions have become autonomous inside you and even if you interact with people who are not a threat to you you will behave with them in the same manner as you would may behave when you seen the first person and not only that when we start even seeing the most innocuous things the most beautiful things the reptilian brain because now it's in a constant state of activation it will just perceive it being a threat for instance a person sees a tulsi it's so sacred it's so beautiful well, nothing absolutely threatening about it but the person will sit and think oh it's so nice initially and then he will think oh in my mother in law's place there was a tulsi plant and she used to water it oh and then the thoughts will shift to mother in law and she will he will she or he will say that oh that lady is terrible and that terrible is and you look at all kinds of those emotions and what is being stimulated your reptilian brain or your snake brain okay now look at this it's a boardroom nothing absolutely threatening about it but the person will look oh my boss he shouted at me so moment he sees the boardroom and again which part of the brain is getting stimulated the reptilian brain look at this puppy ha uh, it's so, so looks so nice it looks so cute Uh, but oh you know the thoughts will go oh, my sister was bitten by a dog oh there was this person who died of rabies and again you have uh, you know the reptilian brain getting stimulation so we are in a state of war because initially all the inputs which are coming are deceiving our brain to think that there is a crisis or there is a war outside and after a period of time they have become autonomous so every form of stimulation rather than being processed by the human brain is directly going into the reptilian or the old brain or the limbic system and what can the reptilian brain do it can only do three things it can either fight run away or induce thoughts about reproduction and that's the same thing 
you know we are now reproduction in reptiles happens only when it is required they have those feelings you know when that reproduction is required but what are we doing we are constantly feeding ourselves with videos with advertisements with movies which is again stimulating that area of a reptilian brain or and producing the thoughts of lust even when there is absolutely no you know requirement or there is no necessity or there is no need or there is absolutely you know there is no relevance of that feeling even then that feelings come up so fundamentally this is what it is we have disruption of peace because every kind of stimulation which is going inside our brain is not being processed inside our human brain it is directly going into the most primitive area of the brain which is the reptilian brain or the limbic system and the reptilian brain is in control and what can the reptilian brain do this is what it can do that's it it doesn't it's not capable of doing any other function this is the only function it can execute and what is the problem so whenever you know the reptilian brain is in a constant state of activation there are certain substances which are ready released inside our body and these are called as catecholamines and what do these catecholamines do they will tighten our muscles they will keep us always in a state of constant stress you know our heart beat goes up we have palpitations we are always in fear constant fear we are always in constant tension uh, we have tension headaches we are fighting fight. that is what these substances do in contrast to certain substances which are released by human brain which are called as love hormones which will allow a person these hormones are released you know when a mother is nurturing a child so this will allow the muscles to relax uh, and the person itself will become relaxed uh, so these are the substances or hormones which are supposed to be released but because it's the reptilian brain which is constantly in the stimulus mode or it is on the constant state of activation these are the kind of hormones or the i would say catecholamines or these are the hormones which are being constantly being released we need to reverse this flow right now it's the reptilian brain which is controlling we need to reverse this flow now here i would like to tell you two stories which have had a great source of uh, influence on me because they have a direct relevance to how the reptilian brain works and these are upanishads i was trying to ask my mother the names of the kings but i couldn't remember uh, and i searched the internet i couldn't find but i will tell you the story because that forms the basis to understand the two basic functions of the reptilian brain so am i audible rahul ji i hope the internet is stable uh, yes dear audible yes thank you so the first story is about the virtuous king who wanted to experience all the vices so this was story of a king who was virtuous who rules who he loses his wife but he rules his kingdom with all responsibility he ensures he takes the full burden of responsibility is working from morning till evening till late in the night and finally when he becomes old he comes up with a very very uh, i would say very very uh, strange request to his son he says my son my whole life i have worked and i always felt that there are certain emotions i have never experienced which i should not experience at this age uh, and you will understand what he means by that uh, and i would like to go away from the kingdom and i have a feeling that if i experience them i'm going to be completely satisfied i'm going to be completely fulfilled and then i'm going to come back so if you take over the kingdom and give me the permission i want to leave the kingdom i want to go to areas where nobody can recognize me and i would like to experience all these vices uh, and fulfill this desire that i have not experienced them or i have not you know uh, fulfilled them and then i would like to come back and he goes away for a couple of years and when he comes back after a couple of years he is totally changed person he is restless uh, and he doesn't have an attention span his hands are trembling and then he tells something to his son he says my son you know i went away i have experienced experienced all these vices but i have understood that these vices can never be fulfilled it is like pouring ghee into fire if you want to put off the fire you cannot do it by putting ghee into it 
what is the scientific relevance of this experience the scientific relevance of this experience is that the reptilian brain can never be satisfied which means that it provides you an illusion so let us say somebody has hurt you you think that you can go and hurt this person and hit back this person and you will get the sense of revenge and you will be happy it doesn't happen so like mahatma gandhi said that if you blind one person's eye and that person also blinds your eye the whole world goes blind what he means is that you are only going to ignite the reptilian brain you are only going to stimulate the reptilian brain because the structure of the reptilian brain is that it can never be satisfied and it creates an illusion that if you experience one more vice it is going to be satisfied the second story is about a king who was just the contrary and this king was absolutely irresponsible and he indulged in all kinds of vices throughout he never ruled his kingdom with responsibility and finally he develops a venereal disease he has ulcers all over his body and they are you know pouring out pus and his sons finally throw him out of the kingdom and he goes into a forest the only person who goes with the king is his sister and she is going on dressing his ulcers and even in that state she loves him because she has this unconditional love towards his brother but unfortunately even in that state of suffering the only thing that king wanted was lust and the sister could see that he was really suffering because of this because this is what he has done his entire life so at that moment she says something which absolutely stuns him and which completely destroys him she says look here as far as my souls are concerned i am your sister that my soul knows but if this is what you want you can use my body what is there no because after all i love you and this is what you are suffering you use my body and when she says that at that moment there is a transformation inside that king so neurobiologically what happens to the king at that point of time at that point of time his newer brain or his new brain takes control of his reptilian brain and the flow has been reversed or rather the flow has been straightened now the flow is from the human brain to the reptilian brain the reptilian brain is no more the master the human brain or the newer brain is the master so this is what we need to do we need to reverse the flow rather we need to correct the flow and it's not possible just for the man or woman can achieve it on their own but not men this is because the kind of connections women have are totally different so scientifically we say that women are right brain people men are right left brain people because the functions which are sustained or which are uh, being generated from the left side of the brain so we have two halves of the brain and they are connected in between and this is how the brain looks when you cut it so the left brain is capable of generating language logic reasoning mathematics and so on and this stimulation impulses from the left brain now flows into the right brain for final processing and what does the right brain stand for it stands for intuition for direction for location and for awareness so that is why in a way women are much more superior as they can execute processed information faster than the left brain so what is intuition intuition is that people instinctively know whether this is right or wrong and that is a strong part of many women most of the when what will they do most of the men they will try to apply logic reasoning they'll draw a chart they will say this is are the pros these are the cons they will again analyze they will again do reasoning whereas a woman can instantly come up this is right this is wrong that is because intuition is a processed information where they draw all the information from the left hemisphere and they process it in the right hemisphere and that is the superiority of women because women are capable of powerful summations of stimulus so they can create intense emotions now paradoxically the modern civilization abhors emotions so if you look at most of the western civilization even indian civilization you know we are passing through such moments of emotion of laughter or grief we are not supposed to cry out people in villages you know they still cry openly they still grief openly but the more civilized society is supposed to be 
so when your near and dear one goes you are supposed to maybe shed a tear or two and maintain yourself you are not supposed to express your emotions which scientifically is wrong emotions are the most superior form of processed information inside our brain calculation even a calculator can do and the intelligence of a calculator is that of an ant if you look at the iq of a calculator is supposed to be 0.01 or something if you look up on the internet no so even an ant can do that kind of calculation technically with their circuits but emotions are something which is generated by a very superior brain and paradoxically our civilization doesn't allow us to express emotions whereas women are capable of expressing emotions because they are capable of powerful summations of stimulus in brain that is why they are cradles of any society any civilization and like shri imam bhagwan says societies which respect women prosper because they contribute to that powerful summations of neural stimulations of that society and they are capable of nurturing the society as a mother sister or a wife hence it's important that there is an adequate synergy between both women and men and that is why shri bhagwan says that you have to have a radical uh, transformation which i'm sure he means that there has to be reversal of flow or correction of flow or flow of stimulation or impulses from the newer brain to the older brain there has to be an adequate synergy of men and women and where does the synergy happen that happens only in marriage nowhere else you can have that synergy in the current age if you go away to some forest or mountains the only thing you'll end up having is lusty thoughts you'll have anger you'll get restlessness you'll get uh, you know palpitations you'll have anger and again you'll come back to the same state so now let us go back to the current state so currently there is a snake active inside us which is a reptilian brain so this is so this this is a snake this is an actual snake so if you look at a snake the predominant brain which is active inside it in a way the snake is better than us because it does have these three functions but it doesn't execute this fun- these three functions all the times so it doesn't suffer so whenever there is a requirement it executes these three functions and then it lives perhaps peacefully but what is happening in humans in humans the reptilian brain is active this is sending impulses into the human brain and why is this happening because the human brain is receiving impulses by which it feels that there is a constant state of war or crisis so all these impulses are directly going to reptilian brain and the reptilian brain is now controlling the human brain saying that look here we are in a constant state of war or crisis because this is a impulses you are receiving from outside and this information is now being processed inside the humans which include you know feelings of aggression fear comparison jealousy we have so much of nomenclature for all this kind of and fear intense amount of fear and that is the paradox of human civilization today because we are constantly again i'm repeating ad nauseum we are constantly in the state of activating you know stimulating our reptilian brain because of the inappropriate impulses received from us and this is being reflected at every level at individual level you know during you know we cannot stay quietly at one place we cannot withstand boredom we have to run to something in families during the covid crisis you know there is so much of divorces because for the first time uh, husbands and wives are interacting with each other and they just cannot tolerate each other so it's very difficult for us to understand that the war is inside it's not between husbands and wives in communities you know, there is no peace in community you have a colony there is so much of fights the rwo is fighting the president so on countries nuclear stockpiling and what not and everything starts from where from the reptilian brain inside us so here i would like to kind of further give some amount of extrapolation to what shri bhagwan has taught that again i would like to make a disclaimer that mine is not a spiritual talk but it is to add some kind of scientific reasoning to what has been already taught by shri amma bhagwan so that what has been taught to us can better can be better consolidated within us so the question is how can we stop the onslaught of reptilian brain as per shri bhagwan's teachings how can we reverse the flow or correct the flow so that the impulses now flow from the newer brain to the older brain and we are able to make the old brain understand that it is not the master but it is the servant 
we have three verticals which has been talked and here i would like to tell you how each one of this vertical helps to correct the flow or reverse the flow so that the flow is now from the newer brain to the reptilian brain so the first is awareness that is the first vertical which we have been taught by shri bhagwan and i think nowhere else i have heard so beautifully being explained about awareness now awareness we all know is a function of human brain the reptilian brain is not capable of generating awareness it could have some form of primitive cell awareness for its survival but being aware of your thoughts being aware of your emotions being aware of yourself is the function of human brain now when people have strokes large areas of brain are destroyed so in some people when there is a right sided stroke or right side of the brain is being destroyed there is a very interesting condition called as hemi neglect which develops whereby the right brain you know controls the left side of the body left brain controls the right side of the body so when a large area of the right parietal lobe is destroyed a person develops a right hemi neglect which means uh, left hemi neglect, which means he is not aware of one half of the body so let us say there is a stroke on the right side the left side is not moving because now the la large area of the right side of the brain is destroyed and you lift up the left hand and say whose hand is this the patient will answer oh i don't know what is this. whose hand is maybe it's your hand so that awareness that this hand belongs to you is lost and this is an established scientific problem it's called as a hemi neglect where the person is not aware of one half of the body there are similarly several other interesting conditions which developed in diseases of the brain there is another condition called as autotopopognosia it's a very difficult word to pronounce and all these words come from latin words which means that the person has lost awareness of each part of the body to itself so he cannot even though there is no weakness of the hand he doesn't understand what is the relationship of the fingers to the forearm and what is the relationship of the forearm to the arm and so on so he cannot move any of his hands or legs in a coordinated manner so the phenomena of awareness is a function of the newer brain or the human brain and if you practice awareness obviously we are going to strengthen the circuits within the human brain and this will finally allow us to see or rather correct the flow or reverse the flow and allow the impulses to flow from the newer brain to the reptilian brain and that is why we need to have awareness so every time there is an onslaught from the reptilian brain we have to imagine that the snake is attacking us and just by knowing that the snake is attacking us inside us we will know that itself is awareness and over a period of time you know the sir we are going to enhance our circuits within our newer brain and we will be able to overpower the reptilian brain the second vertical which shri bhagwan speaks about is helplessness so scientifically how does it correlate with this analogy so whenever we have a sense of helplessness when does a person become helpless whenever the person accepts defeat supposing the reptilian brain thinks that there is a constant state of war going on and when the human brain says oh it's all over i have given up i am defeated that's when the reptilian generator will switch off because it will understand that there is no more threat to that particular creature so the reptilian brain function is very specific it will become active only when there is a threat to the creature survival of the creature but when the creature itself is saying that i am defeated i am helpless i have given up the reptilian brain will slowly be switched off and that is a very powerful mechanism by which we can switch off the reptilian generator i call it as a generator because it's, it's you know it's making so much of noise it's humming it's constantly in activity the third vertical which shri bhagwan speaks of is gratitude which again is a function of the newer brain it's not at all the function of the reptilian brain and again this will strongly enhance our cortical circuits and will help to correct the flow or reverse the flow so that the, there is flow of impulses from the newer brain into the reptilian brain so diagrammatically our reptilian brain or our snake brain is active and if we develop awareness and experience it so we have fear we have to understand that the snake inside our brain is generating this or the snake brain is generating i don't want to use the word snake because you know people will develop hatred against snakes 
that's how you know complex our brain is you know that's again the reptilian brain acting you know, because you say if there's a snake inside us you start hitting snakes you know, so let us say our reptilian brain or a primitive brain or our old brain is active you know, and every time there is a sense of fear we say oh i have fear so that's a that's a traditional teachings of oneness so you experience it you are become aware of it and it will allow our uh, newer brain to see we accept defeat so we say it's a truce i've given up i am tired there is no more war i've given up so moment you keep on saying it you know the reptilian brain will get pacified because you want have to understand you cannot defeat reptilian brain by stimulating it if you if you develop anger if you develop even more anger it's impossible no uh, the reptilian brain can never accept defeat the more you stimulate it the more it will become stimulated and then we express gratitude again this is strengthening our circuits in the newer brain and this has to become a cycle this have these are all connected to each other and they are almost simultaneous processes and after some time they kind of will enhance our cortical circuits and make them strong now there are certain you know all these three verticals cannot happen by themselves they have to be joined by some kind of an adhesive or by some kind of a glue and what is that glue which can join all these three of them so that it can bring about a meaning to all these three processes i believe that this adhesive these adhesives are grace because this is unknowable this is unmeasurable this is not possible for human intelligence to see and we have to accept it you know like you know people say there are there are black holes in space or there is or let us say empty matter or there is so we don't see these are unknowable so we have to accept that they are unknowable and then there has to be a sense of integrity i believe that is the second most important glue which joins all these three verticals because if you experience fear you say oh i have conquered fear it's not going to happen you have to be you know quite integral that you have not conquered fear you still have fear uh, so you need to have integrity and obviously the third adhesive or the third glue which will join all these three verticals is a foot and this these three i believe so dasa ji may correct me if she thinks she wants to modify it uh, but i believe these are the three adhesives which need to join these three verticals and in the core i believe we have mantra and the rituals because they appeal to the subconscious brain so there are many things you know logically we can say a lot of things about to the brain but still the brain will refuse to understand now let me tell you something in regards to mantras and rituals you know we have all experienced mantras and rituals in oneness but you know i have lost my father for the past 15 days and i was you know we were all experiencing this tremendous amount of grief tremendous amount of sadness and we decided we have agreed to go through the entire hindu rituals completely i believe there was a breakthrough which came during three processes the first process was when i was taking that matka or the mud pot around my father's body just before its cremation and a hole was made and the water was burning a uh, water was pouring out and then at one point the priest or the purohit tells me that now you have to throw this pot behind your head and walk away without seeing now moment after all the rituals were commit completed moment i threw the matka over my head and walked away i felt a sudden sense of peace coming in i felt that yes there was a closure happening now the second breakthrough came when i was doing my 10th day ceremony again i felt immense sense of closure happening and the final sense of closure came on 12th day when we had two priests so one was sitting facing the east direction one was sitting facing the uh, south direction so the priest facing the south direction was supposed to be contributing whatever he is contributes towards my father's uh, stomach or his fulfillment and one facing the east is a present generation and when they started he, uh, eating we started doing hymns we started doing the havan chanting all the rituals and this has to go on till the finish eating and moment they finished the rituals also stopped and i had an immense sense of peace descending inside me i could feel that this food or the feeling of the satiety or the satisfaction has actually reached my father's soul 
so i do strongly feel that there is a strong sense to mantras and rituals because they do appeal to the subconscious mind so let me summarize what i have spoken here why are we not able to achieve peace because we are deceiving our brain thinking that we are in a constant state of war or crisis or reproduction which is inappropriate it has absolutely there is no function for most of us and hence the reptilian brain is in the state of control because the brain thinks we are in state of war or crisis and not the human brain we are mixing wrong experiences with wrong memories so as a result even when we are looking at those experiences we are linking them up with wrong memories so for instance you know we have somebody who has seen her mother in law you know watering the tulsi plant now that is an experience so she hates her mother in law and later on now she is every time she sees tulsi she starts hating tulsi plant and same thing here you know i was telling that imagine if you have a snake inside your brain i won't like to say that because now your reptilian brain will start linking hatred to snake you will say oh because of the snake i'm having all those it's not that the snake is happy it is you who is not happy now we cannot achieve it individually there is a strong partnership between both male and female brains required and that is why i believe shri bhagwan says marriage is the most optimal way to achieve this mechanism of reversal of flow or correction of flow and to stop the war and to allow the new brain to take over and we need to enhance our cortical circuits we need to enhance our circuits within our new brain and i have told you in the beginning the way the brain circuits function is through function of kindling whereby you keep on stimulating a certain circuits and it will become autonomous over a period of time recruitment you plant an emotion let it be any kind of emotion and this emotion will grow there is no way this emotion will stay static because that is a functional capability of the brain that is a functional basis of the brain that whenever you whenever you uh, plant an emotion it will grow through the mechanisms of recruitment and through mechanisms of reverberating circuits whatever circuits so we can enhance our cortical circuits like i told you by these three verticals awareness helplessness and gratitude and i believe they have to be joined by adhesives which include grace effort and also uh, integrity and in the core center of course we need to appease the subconscious mind by mantras and rituals and this has been my personal take or my personal opinion on how uh, we can link on what shri amma bhagwan says to establish scientific facts to establish scientific publications with little bit of extrapolations and hypothesis our parameters for growth and progress has to change we have to move from an era of competition to collaboration which is the uh, collaboration indicates the new brain and the sense of competition has become so strong that it is there even between husband and wife so whenever we have parties we says oh you have bought this watch oh i have bought this iphone oh look at this that sense of crazy competition has to stop and we have to keep on realizing that this is the reptilian brain which is so the reptilian brain in human has become so complex that sometimes it's so difficult to even identify it we have to move from democracy to unicracy there's no word like unicracy but i like that word and when i looked up onto the internet it says there are some organizations which is called as unicracy but i like the word because it symbolizes a collaboration it symbolizes activation of the newer brain we have to move from outwards to inwards we have to understand there is no war outside the actual war is inside us the fundamental war is inside us we need to stop the reptilian generator we need to enhance the cortical circuits we need to reverse the flow we need to correct the flow we need the human brain to take control of the reptilian brain that is why we need to move inwards we cannot find peace by going into some holiday resorts like maldives we cannot find peace by buying whatever stuff we want that is only going to add fuel to fire like the king you know who wanted to experience vices because he thought just by experiencing vices uh, you know i am going to have a sense of fulfillment you are not going to have that that is not the scientific mechanism how the reptilian brain works you that is just like adding ghee into the homa we have to move away from analysis to experiencing by analysis i mean that more you analyze 
the more amount of stimulation you're going to give to the reptilian brain. For instance, you don't like a person, you will say, oh, that person didn't look at me properly, didn't behave me properly. This is all adding analysis on your cortical circuits, which is again feeding your reptilian brain. You have to stop that. I think we have to stop that. Uh, as per teachings of Shrema Bhagavan, we have to become, become aware, we have to accept defeat, and we have to develop a sense of gratitude inside us. We have to move from a sense of separate entity to an understanding that we are actually part of the whole. And this, I think this process has to go on happening and happening. And that is when we will keep on activating and further strengthening our human brain. We have to move from war to peace. Let me end my talk by giving you this example. Uh, now, Dr. Tyson is a very celebrated director for Center for Earth and Space, and he has been studying all the planets since a very long time. And he said this, we think we are small as compared to Earth, solar system and cosmos. We think we are not even specks of dust. I would like to think we are big as it is the same atoms. It's the same molecules that are present within us as is present in the cosmos. We are not the mute spectators, but participants in this colossal process. And hence, our role is very important. On the left side, if you look, it's a figure of Nataraja. And like Sri Bhagwan says, you know, there are all this universes which is going around him. And look at him. He's not analyzing those universes. He is just experiencing them. He is fully applying his cortical circuits. He's fully stimulating his cortical circuits. They are in a full state of overactivation because of which he is able to experience the entire cosmos. And at that point of time, he realizes that he is not separate, but is part of the whole. So I would say war is futile because everything is you. When we are everything, what is the point of war? There is absolutely no point of war. And I think once this realization descends on us, we will become peaceful humans, we will become a peaceful race, and we will ensure that our race survives through this crisis. Thank you so much. So I hope I was audible to all of you. Yes, Dr. Ji. So now, namaste to all. Let us all offer our infinite gratitude to our beloved Sri Amma Bhagwan, who in their supreme compassion made us receive immeasurable blessings. Thank you so much, Sri Amma Bhagwan. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarachandraji, for clarifying so clearly the various connections of brain and its relationship to the present situation. We can now see how and why brain rewiring is essential for the survival of the human species. It is now clear, Sri Amma Bhagwan's teachings are so scientifically relevant to the ongoing experiments and brain mapping. Now we shall together take a sankalpa and pray that Sri Amma Bhagwan's vision of a neurobiological shift comes true as a benediction for mankind. Thank you so much once again. Namaste. Amma Bhagwan Shri. Namaste Dasaji. Thank you. So यहाँ पर आज का ये सत्संग संपूर्ण होता है और हमें जो भी भगवान के ज्ञान को वैज्ञानिक रूप से उन्होंने जो हमें बताया है उसका हिंदी में अनुवाद आपके क्षेत्र के दासा जी आपके लिए करेंगे उसका सम, उसका समय दासा जी के द्वारा ही आप लोगों को बताया जाएगा सभी को भी धन्यवाद नमस्ते अमा भगवान शरणम समस्ता सुखी लोका 
samasta sujino bhava Sukhino Bhavantu Sukhino Bhavantu